When a blood vessel of our cardiovascular system is injured, for instance, we have a rupture in the wall of that blood vessel, the process of hemorrhage will take place. And hemorrhage is the medical condition that describes the process by which blood escapes out of the cardiovascular system and into the surrounding area found outside the blood vessel. Now, hemorrhage can be very dangerous. It can cause damage to the tissues and organs of our body. And so, to prevent hemorrhage from actually taking place and causing damage, we have the blood clotting cascade that is immediately initiated. And when the blood clotting cascade is initiated, we produce these blood clots and the blood clots are used to create temporary seals along that area where the cut actually exists on that blood vessel. So we know that blood clots can be very, very beneficial. But on the other hand, if we form too many blood clots, or if we can't break down the blood clots properly, or if those blood clots escape that localized area where that injury took place, that can lead to many, many problems. Now, one problem is thrombosis. So thrombosis is basically the process by which we form the blood clots. And if these blood clots are formed excessively, they can basically escape into the cardiovascular system and eventually they can aggregate at the wrong place and that can block the flow of blood. And this is known as an embolism. So an embolism is the process by which these abnormally or these blood clots aggregate abnormally and they block that flow of blood to some area, some tissue or some organ of our body. And that can lead to many problems. For instance, if we have an embolism that takes place in the coronary artery, that can lead to a heart attack. And obviously a heart attack is very, very dangerous. So there is a very, very fine line between thrombosis and hemorrhage. And to prevent either one of these from taking place and damaging our organs and tissues, our body must be able to very precisely and very effectively regulate the coagulation cascade. And so previously we discussed the activation of this process. Now we're going to discuss the inhibition. So how exactly do we downregulate and inhibit the different enzymes involved in the coagulation cascade process? So this is what we're going to focus on in this lecture. And we're going to discuss several important key factors that inhibit the enzymes that are part of the coagulation cascade. So let's begin with the molecule known as tissue factor pathway inhibitor or simply TFPI. Now, this is a polypeptide. And what the polypeptide does is it ultimately binds onto a complex that is part of the extrinsic pathway of the blood clotting cascade. So if we think back to the blood clotting cascade, we have these two different pathways. We have the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway. And this polypeptide blocks essentially that extrinsic pathway from taking place. So in the extrinsic pathway, we have the tissue factor, the glycoprotein found on the membrane of the endothelium of the blood vessel basically forms a dimer complex with factor seven. And once we form this complex, this complex then reacts with factor 10 to basically activate it and begin the final common pathway. Now, what the tissue factor pathway, uh, what the tissue factor pathway inhibitor does is it binds onto the tissue factor, factor seven complex, and it inhibits its activity. And it also has domains on this polypeptide that can bind onto the individual factor seven and that factor 10. And it can inhibit both of these different molecules. Now, what about our intrinsic pathway? So let's take a look at protein C. Protein C is a vitamin K dependent protease. And what that means is it depends on the presence of vitamin K to actually effective correctly, to actually function correctly and effectively. So if we don't have vitamin K, if we have a vitamin K deficiency in our body, that will basically mean that protein C cannot actually function properly. Now, protease basically means when it acts with its target molecule, it hydrates it breaks the peptide bonds at specific sites on the target molecule. So protein C is a protease, meaning it digests its, its target molecule. So 
Protein C, interestingly, is actually activated by thrombin, and thrombin is that very same molecule that is used to actually form fibrin from fibrinogen, and fibrin is used to form the blood clots. So thrombin has a dual purpose. It not only actually forms the blood clots, but it also is responsible for inhibiting the coagulation process by activating protein C. Because what protein C does is it breaks down and digests two important stimulating proteins part of that coagulation cascade, namely factor V and factor VIII. Now, factor V, if we remember from the previous several lectures, is basically that stimulating protein that binds onto factor X and that activates thrombin. On the other hand, we have factor VIII, which is also known as the anti-hemophilic factor, and this is responsible for binding onto factor IX, which activates factor X into its active form. So protein C is responsible for essentially inhibiting the intrinsic pathway, while tissue factor pathway inhibitor is responsible for inhibiting the extrinsic pathway. So now let's take a look at another important molecule that acts as an irreversible inhibitor to thrombin, and this is antithrombin-3. So antithrombin-3 is a glycoprotein whose structure actually resembles the structure of an inhibitor we spoke about previously, alpha-1 antitrypsin. So if you remember, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin is that irreversible inhibitor that inhibits elastase as well as trypsin. Well, in the same exact way, antithrombin-3 uh, anti basically binds to the active site and inhibits the activity of thrombin. And by inhibiting thrombin, we basically inhibit the final common pathway and we inhibit the formation of blood clots. Now, antithrombin-3 can also form complexes with many other factors. So if we think back to the intrinsic pathway, we know that the intrinsic pathway contains factor 12, factor 11, factor 9. And these three factors can also be inhibited by antithrombin-3. And antithrombin-3 can also inhibit factor 10, which is basically that converging point between the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathway. It's the beginning of that final common pathway. So we see that antithrombin-3 is a glycoprotein that resembles the structure of alpha-1 antitrypsin. Now it binds with very high affinity to thrombin and it activates its activity. And it also blocks, it forms complexes with other factors of the intrinsic pathway and the final final common pathway. So we have factor 12, we have factor 11, and we have factor 9 that are part of the intrinsic pathway, and then we have the factor 10 which is basically the initiation of the final common pathway. It's that factor that is part of that converging point between the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway. Now let's move on to heparin and heparin cofactor 2. So heparin cofactor 2 is actually a molecule that enhances the activity of heparin. So let's begin by discussing what heparin actually is. So if we examine the connective tissue found surrounding our blood vessels, we're going to find immune cells known as mast cells. So mast cells are these immune cells, part of our adaptive immune system, which basically release an important glycose aminoglycan known as heparin. And heparin is this negatively charged glycose aminoglycan that basically enhances the activity of antithrombin-3. It stimulates antithrombin-3 to basically form these irreversible inhibited complexes with not only thrombin, but all these other factors. So factor 12, factor 11, factor 10, and factor 9. So heparin acts as an anticoagulant by stimulating the binding of antithrombin-3 to thrombin and the other serum proteases, these ones that we mentioned just a moment ago. Now, what do we mean by an anticoagulant? Well, 
the process of coagulation means to form the blood clot. So anticoagulation means to not form the blood clots. And that's exactly what the heparin does. It stimulates antithrombin 3 to basically inhibit the activity of thrombin, which means we cannot form those blood clots. And as I mentioned a moment ago, heparin is or heparin cofactor 2 is basically this protein that floats around our plasma, the blood plasma, and it basically assists heparin to basically bind onto the antithrombin 3 to inactivate, inhibit the activity of thrombin. So everything we spoke about uh, up to this point basically involved actually inhibiting these specific enzymes and proteins that are found within the coagulation cascade. But the next question is, once we actually form those blood clots, once we actually form those fibrin mesh-like structures we call blood clots that actually seals off and creates that temporary protective layer that prevents hemorrhage, what actually happens to the blood clots once the cells actually uh, once the cells actually fix that ruptured area in that blood vessel so blood clots are temporary solutions to sealing off ruptures in the blood vessels and once those ruptures are fixed by the cells of our body how exactly does our body actually remove and digest these blood clots because these blood uh, these blood clots must actually be hydrolyzed digested and broken down by the cells of our body well we have the function of a very important protease serine protease known as plasmid so plasmid is basically this serine protease that once activated it finds it locates these fibrin molecules and then hydrolyzes those fibrin molecules into smaller pieces and those smaller pieces dissolve into our blood plasma and they travel to the liver and the liver cells basically hydrolyze and break down these even further and then different components are basically recycled by our cell now plasmin like most of these different enzymes involved in the coagulation cascade initially exist in their inactive precursor zymogen form and the zymogen of plasmin is plasminogen so plasminogen is activated by another molecule known as tissue type plasminogen activator so tpa so essentially plasminogen is a zymogen an inactive form of plasmin that has a very high affinity for fibrin but before it actually becomes active it must be activated by tissue type plasminogen activated tpa and once tpa activates plasminogen the plasmin then locates that blood clot that consists of those fibrin molecules and it cleaves it breaks the peptide bonds in those fibrin molecules and then the fibrin molecules basically dissociate from that blood vessel wall and they travel to the liver cell and the liver cells essentially digest and recycle those blood clots so plasmin is a serum protease which is responsible for actually breaking down and digesting those blood clots and that ultimately prevents the process of thrombosis from actually taking place for instance, if we examine an individual that basically develops an embolism in the coronary artery, so essentially, if we give an individual that is experiencing a heart attack, the tissue type plasminogen activator, if we inject it into the blood of that individual, what happens is this tissue type plasminogen activator initiates these plasmin molecules, so activates, transforms the plasminogen into plasmin. And, and what plasmin does is plasmin moves into that coronary artery of the heart of that individual experiencing the heart attack and it basically begins to break down the blood clot that is formed as a result of that embolism and so by giving an individual who is experiencing heart attack the tissue type plasminogen activator that greatly increases the likelihood that individual will actually survive that heart attack so we can see that these different molecules can be used for medicinal purposes in many different ways but generally speaking, because 
there is this very fine line between thrombosis, which is basically the formation of the blood clots, and hemorrhage, which is the process by which blood leaks out of the blood vessels, because there's a very fine line between these two processes, our body must be able to actually not only activate the coagulation cascade process, but also inhibit it. And so these are the different molecules that are basically used to control and inhibit the activity, the formation of the blood clots, the activity of the coagulation cascade.